Good morning, everyone. Thanks very much for joining us for this Arizona Capital Times Morning Scoop. What do Arizona voters want? A discussion on the 2024 Arizona voters agenda. An incredible panel of two accomplished people I'm sure many of you have heard of, if not met in person, Sybil Francis, who is the chair, president, and CEO of Center for the Future of Arizona, and also Paul Bentz, Senior Vice President of Research and Strategy at High Ground Incorporated. To remind you, we'll be talking about what Arizona voters want. It's a discussion on the 2024 Arizona voters agenda, and we'd love to have you participate by using the Q&A function, not the chat function, but the Q&A to send us questions throughout this morning. And what we'll be doing at that point as well is I will be trying to filter them in to advance the conversation. We won't sort of lump them in at the end. If it fits with what the discussion we're having at that point, I will try to get them in as well as I can to give Sybil and Paul a chance to weigh in on some of the questions you may have. A reminder, you probably don't need it, but please be civil. Uh, please write things that are as, as direct and clear as possible without being too argumentative or not polite. Let's put it in that gentle fashion. <laughs> And, and as we get started, um, again, Center for the Future of Arizona is putting on this webinar, and we'd love to have Sybil Francis weigh in. Just to, Sybil, we'd love to have a, a description of, first of all, remind us what Center for the Future of Arizona does, why it's important, and where the Arizona voters' agenda fits into that. Thanks so much, Steve. It's really great to be here with you this morning. And Paul, I'm so delighted as our public opinion survey research partner for Arizona voters' agenda. It's really great to be here together. So Center for the Future of Arizona, we're a nonprofit 501c3 and celebrating our 20th anniversary this year. And, you know, one of the things that has been really important to us as an organization that is committed to bringing Arizonans together to create a stronger and brighter future for our state really is, well, what do Arizonans want for our future? Is it really up to us to, to decide that as Center for the Future of Arizona? So some time long ago, 15 years ago, we created a unique partnership with the Gallup organization to ask Arizonans what they thought was important to our future. And some of you may be familiar with those two really massive surveys that we did in 2009 and then 2020 again. And that was really to set a longer term vision for our state based on what mattered to Arizonans. And we we um, discovered that we have these shared public values, that we agree on much more than we disagree as Arizonans. Uh, and we created a set of progress meters to measure how we're doing on those areas. But two years ago in the 22 election, we thought, wouldn't it be interesting to ask likely voters in Arizona what was important to them in that election period? So a little bit of a, of a more contemporary view of likely voters uh, and what they wanted. So it was important to us to understand that across a number of uh, major important issues that included ones we had discovered in the Gallup work that were important to Arizonans. So it was really fascinating because, you know, we hear so much about all these hot button issues, uh, things that we hear often in the media that are responding or reporting on what we hear from candidates running for office. But we thought, let's dig a little bit deeper and really center the voices of Arizona likely voters in the debate. Let's give them a seat at the table, if you will, um, to understand what matters to them. And, um, you know, we're going to be talking more about those findings. But again, what we found, which was fascinating, particularly when we hear about this narrative of polarization and division, is there are so many areas of agreement among likely voters that are important to them for our state. And yet we're not necessarily hearing about those issues either from the candidates or being reported by the media. So we really wanted to center the voices of likely voters. And it was partly for our own information because we base our work on what matters to Arizonans, but it's so fascinating that we decided that we wanted to share that. And so before we get into some of the methodology, obviously with Paul, we get into some more specifics. I love that you started us off with that. Um, would you mind delving into that a little bit more, that the political environment we see, um, in fact, I want to I want to give one number to folks, that 85% of voters, uh, based on AVA, feel that the media has created more political division, which means it seems like this time is even more ripe for something like Arizona Voters Agenda to say, okay, maybe we don't entirely agree on what the solutions are, but we can actually agree that we want to move forward as a state together. Yes, I think many people can are getting very discouraged uh, when we hear so much about how polarized and divided we are. This is a massive national narrative, and I think it's the same here in Arizona. And yet, in many ways, I think it doesn't necessarily ring true to 
people, when they think about their neighbors or the conversations they're having with people, yes, we have disagreements. We're not Pollyannish. We know we don't agree on everything, but it was really, it's, it's so important, I think, to kind of provide this counter counter to this narrative of polarization and division that I think is discouraging. And, you know, who knows, maybe that's even a huge impact on people not voting and all sorts of negative impacts. So we're really working on how can we build a positive agenda and how can we help uh, candidates running for office in particular know, hey, there's things that you can actually address that matter to Arizonans that can be can lead us forward in a positive way. Well, I wonder if you'd weigh in on that briefly, considering you're someone who has been at great political ties in this state for a long time, worked with politicians, worked on polls. How does that reflect what Sybil said with the voters' agenda versus what we're sort of hearing um, out in that that atmosphere that we walk around in? Uh, right. I, I think one of the biggest things that we've seen is that, uh, especially with polling and data, is that folks feel like they're trying to find those pinch points, those wedge issues to try to drive turnout or to try to gain a narrow edge. And things like the Arizona voters agenda demonstrate that there are big issues that people agree on. And quite frankly, candidates can win by talking about. And so instead of picking the really narrow, small uh, issues that maybe appeal to a, a, a tiny segment just to gain a leg up, what they can do is appeal to a broader portion of the audience, talk to that general electorate and be successful. I, I often say you can win talking about these items. And I think that's something that gets lost sort of in our election system these days. Well, and and Sybil, let me ask you about a very important phrase. Again, Paul, I keep putting this off. I will ask about methodology in a moment. But Sybil, this extremely important phrase, significant agreement in order for something to make the Arizona voters agenda. Can you let our viewers know what that means? Absolutely. I'm sure many of folks are saying to themselves, well, what, what does that mean? How do you get to decide what's on the voters agenda? So let me just be completely transparent. And I think we have a very rigorous uh, methodology for doing that. So, you know, to win an election, you need 50% or more of, of the vote. So what we decided is to make it onto the Arizona voters agenda, those things where we are saying Arizona likely voters agree. There has to be 50% strong agreement across the board. But we go further than that in a very rigorous fashion and say we have to have not only 50% across the board agreement, we have to have 50% strong agreement or support among Republicans, 50% strong agreement or support among independent and unaffiliated voters and strong and a strong agreement among 50% of Democrats, as well as all age groups. So if there's any one demographic in there, any political affiliation or age group that doesn't reach a floor of 50% or higher, it does not make it to the voters agenda. So this is a truly nonpartisan uh, agreement among all the important political affiliations and age groups on any issue that makes it onto the voters' agenda. Paul, quick follow-up on that in terms of your methodology and how you approach this. Excuse me. Sure. So uh, one thing, so there's important work here done by the Center for the Future of Arizona, not only with the Arizona voters' agenda, but the Arizona we want with Gallup. And one of the things that we talked about early on is that the Arizona we want is a view of what the citizens of Arizona want, whether or not they're registered to vote. Uh, it's an important view of sort of Arizona as a whole. But one of the things that we often talked about is that, you know, yeah, but elected officials really only kind of care about those who vote. And in fact, only about 71 percent of the adult population in the state of Arizona is even registered to vote. So three out of every 10 folks who tell you that they're registered to vote are actually lying to you. Sorry to break that news to you. So we actually started with registered voters and then what Sybil talked about, which is really important, is we went to likely voters. These are the people that show up in an election. So uh, 2020 had our second highest voter turnout in state history, 79.9%. So that's 80% of that 71%, which means about 60% or so of the adult population. So we, we decided to look at these likely voters because that's who the candidates want to listen to, the folks that are going to show up in a general election. So a couple things to bear in mind, about half the adult population will be over the age of 50 in a likely election. It is about a four-point Republican advantage, about 38% Republican, 34% Democrat, about 28% unaffiliated voters. So we balance it based on turnout, not registration. As you may know, uh, about a third of our uh, voters are registered Republican, about a third registered Democratic, and a third registered unaffiliated. But our unaffiliates tend to under-participate a little bit. Our Republicans tend to over-participate. So we try to be as accurate as possible using sort of our methodology to reflect what the likely voters uh, look like. And then 
the other thing that we talked about consensus here, having a 50% strong agreement on an issue and then 50% of each partisan and age segment demonstrates these are broad uh, approaches here to these topics. These are things that folks really agree with. And so, you know, sometimes we get a little bit of the, oh, well, every, you know, this is all, there's lots of things that we tested that didn't make it into the agenda. And so that's sort of an important demonstration. The things that do really meet this high standard of support across the board. Well, as we move across, I, yes, sir. Can I just jump in for a sec too, Steve? So I thank you, Paul, so much for explaining the importance of this, these likely voters. When we did this for the first time in 2022, we really had no idea what we were going to find because we had done the Gallup survey, as Paul mentioned, and many of you may be familiar with that. And we'd found these very powerful findings of where we agreed as Arizonans. But again, those were not likely voters. Those were not people who were registered. It was really all Arizonans over 18. And so we didn't know what to what we what to expect. And really what was fascinating was to find the consistency. Despite the fact that we were looking at likely voters, the, the findings were very consistent with Gallup. And so I think that was a, an interesting point that I just wanted to make. Yes, thank you, Sybil. And I wanted to make a quick follow up on Paul there as we go through some of these enormous topics, education, state spending, immigration. We will also discuss some of the points that did not in fact make the voters agenda. And I'd love to have the two of you address that as we move on in the conversation. One other statistic and one other part of the poll I wanted to bring up, and Paul, this actually reflects on what you were saying about getting candidates, elected officials to talk about some of these broader issues. 60% of voters don't believe that current political candidates are addressing the key issues that matter to them. Before we move on to, to education, I'd love to have both of you weigh in on that a bit. Paul, you want to go first? Sure. Uh it's the I, I like to joke, it's why debates are boring, because practitioners of politics have taught candidates to not focus on these issues, quite frankly. And in fact, to find those little negative issues that that folks care about and try to draw differentiations between themselves. But one of the things that we found is that there is significant agreement among the electorate on these key topics that we don't typically talk about and don't get reported. And then the result is that people are frustrated. They don't feel like the candidates are talking about the issues they care most about. Um, and there's really the, the demonstration, especially over the last 10 years, is the art of division. And what we're seeing is there are big areas that folks can talk about, they could win on, they can uh, communicate on. And so that's what one of the challenges that we had is putting together these questions to ask in debates, putting these questions that voters should be asking their candidates. The, these are the types of things that actually voters would like to hear about. So we're trying to narrow that gap and get the conversation back to the issues that voters care about. That's what the voters agenda is about. This is the agenda. This is the things that care about. So we're trying to encourage all of you uh, in the audience and members of the media to, to focus on these issues instead, because that will bring people back and quite frankly, lower that number 85% who think that the media is adding to the division. If you ask about this, we can lower the temperature on that as well. Yeah, and I'll just jump in for a second. This is a little bit of a theme that you might hear throughout as well, which is we have been pretty struck in looking at these results by what appears to be significant gaps between the things that Arizonans care about and what we're hearing candidates for office talking about, and dare I say, even the things that we're getting out of our political system. And so that's certainly as an organization committed to creating a stronger and brighter future for our our state, you know, seeing these gaps between what Arizonans want and what we're we're experiencing or or getting or get our attention. Well, and I have to follow up on Paul's phrase, which I love, Sybil, where he said the art of division. I'm wondering if the Arizona voters agenda could be the art of somehow coalescing, bringing people together. The art of coming together. Absolutely. Yes. Uh, as I mentioned, there are some major topics that we're going to go over. Let's start with education and some of the results in the Arizona voters agenda. So the policy item with the highest level of total support is ensuring teachers are trained in the most effective approaches to teaching reading. And in some ways it feels like it should be obvious, but it also sometimes feels like something like that gets bypassed rather quickly. Uh, Paul, can you explain some of the data on that? And then Sybil, I wanna have you give us some analysis. Sure, I mean, one of the things that I've noted, we've done a lot of work in the education realm when it comes to survey research over the last decade or two. And, uh, you know, instead of doing a PowerPoint presentation slideshow today, I know we're posting some of these findings in the chat. I encourage you to take some time to look at them. 
Um, during the 20 by 2020 debate, and for many, many years, teacher pay was the number one issue facing education, and it's still a very critical issue. But what I've seen over the last 18 months or so is an increase in the desire for investment and attention to uh, reading and mathematics, and much more attention paid to those two topics. So this seems like, well, yeah, of course we should we should do that. But it is really part of a trend that we're seeing that people would like to make sure that we're emphasizing those topics and making sure that students are able to uh, achieve in those topics. And so this really does reflect a lot of the other data I've done at the statewide, regional and local level, particularly for school districts, that we're seeing an emphasis of this, especially post COVID. Sybil, specifically on reading, thoughts on that? No, I just want to echo, I think Paul says it so beautifully, you know, that, um, you know, these are the kinds of things that parents are worried about and thinking about. And yes, it sounds like motherhood and apple pie that they want their children to learn to read. And yet so much of the airwaves are being taken up with banning books. Well, how about let's teach kids to read? You know, so I think this goes to show some of the disconnect between what we hear talked about, those, those kind of hot button issues and what's actually on the minds of parents. I just want to say one off topic for a moment, in case the listeners are on the edges of their seats wondering well, how come we're only talking about certain issues in this particular segment, we are, and we were going to talk about this at the end, but we are doing a second survey after the primary, so if there's any big topic we've left out, that's why you, you won't hear about it today. To that point, one issue is we did conduct this survey in March prior to the Supreme Court decision on abortion, for example. So you won't hear a lot of discussion about that today. That doesn't mean it's not a relevant or important topic. It just is something that we didn't address in this set of data. So just, uh, you know, before someone asks about that, I just wanted to give that caveat as well. Thanks, Paul. And, and a reminder to all of you watching right now, please use the Q&A function if you want to ask a question to Paul or Sybil, and we will get to it as soon as we possibly can. Um, another, you mentioned a hot button issue, Sybil. One hot button issue has been ESAs, vouchers. Um, so one result, private schools that receive state funding should be held to the same standards as public schools when it comes to financial reporting requirements, academic reporting requirements, and employment standards. It may be interesting to folks to, to hear that this is not about whether ESAs or vouchers are good, fair, whatever. It's just that they should be held to the same standard. I think that's a really interesting way to approach it. So but can I start with you first on that one? Just the, the what you would you sort of interpret from that? Well, it was, it was, again, one of those really unknowns, what we would find, you know, ESAs, vouchers uh, have certainly over the years been uh, topics of, of conversation and debate and some controversy occasionally. So we were interested both in what, what uh, the outlook was on funding for vouchers um, slash ESAs, as well as the accountability around those funds, because we've been hearing more about that in recent um, times. So it was interesting. We did ask um, whether uh, likely voters thought that uh, we were spending too much, just enough or not enough on vouchers, and we did not get a consensus. So in that sense, no, no particular viewpoint made the uh, Arizona voters agenda. So there was not agreement on that. But we had a, an astounding 80% of likely voters who agreed that um, state schools receiving state funds through vouchers uh, and ESAs uh, should be held to the same accountability standards as public schools. And Paul, could you chime in on the data a little bit more on that? Yeah, 71% of Republicans, 77% of independent unaffiliated voters, 91% of Democrats all agreed with the accountability measure. So while ESAs and vouchers is certainly a hot topic and murky um, in sort of the level of funding, how much folks want it, the efficacy of the program, what we do see is that there is unanimity when it comes to the accountability of this topic. And the other thing to note is just in education in general, 79% still think that schools require more funding. Uh, people do believe that our schools are underfunded and continue to believe that our teachers are underpaid. So certainly those two things uh, contribute to the overall topic. Um, also just sort of, it, there's not a very rosy outlook on public education right now, only 10% of voters thought that the, the public schools were excellent or very good compared to 46% who dictated that it was poor or failing. Now that doesn't mean everybody 
universally agreed that poor failing is because of funding or because of the topics being taught. There's just sort of a, a negative aspect, and that's about 10 points lower than it was a decade ago. We are seeing some significant pessimism regarding our public schools, despite increases in funding, has to contribute by several sources, including uh, cable news and others. Um, but you know, we've done a lot in education funding over the last 10 years or so, but that, that doesn't mean we're done. Uh, there is still a strong desire among the electorate to continue to invest in public education. Yeah, and I'll just chime in on that. Again, it's been quite, it's probably the most um, consistent finding that we've had over all the survey work that we've done, which is Arizona Arizonans, Arizona voters, uh, want to see more funding in public education. And we just find this, whatever, however we ask the question, the answer is yes. So I know as, as someone who's involved in the, the clean elections debates right now, I have a little bit more interest in some of this, but I know that everyone watching right now, these are people who care about the debates. They want to see what the candidates have to say. And one of the things I think is so fascinating about the Arizona voters agenda is how Paul's incredible data, there's interpretation of that. But I also love the if people go to to the website, uh, ArizonaFuture.org, uh, they can see some more specifics about questions that potentially related to the Arizona voters agenda that moderators or others should be should be asking candidates. Uh, were there any that stood out specifically about related to either ESAs or, or uh, K-12 spending you'd like to bring up? First of all, thank you for mentioning that because as I mentioned early on, we want, we're seeking to center the voices of likely voters in our elections. Uh, the media is a major audience or target, if you will, for us because the media so shape the public conversation and also are in a position to be seeking out answers from candidates about where they stand on issues. And of course, candidate forums are the same thing. So one of the things we committed to early on is based on the findings that we have of what matters to likely voters, we created a set of questions for each of these issues that could be asked of candidates in whatever form, whether it's uh, reporters, whether it's in these candidate forums. And so I think that's an important thing for the audience to know that this is an important, uh, valuable resource that can be used by anyone, really, and it's on our, our website. But as far as education is concerned, um, you know, certainly a very obvious one is the one we were just talking about, which is how, what is your plan for making sure that uh, uh, private schools that receive uh, state funding through the form of ESAs slash vouchers uh, are held accountable to the same standards as public schools? How, you know, one of the things that we found also is that voters do not want to see cuts to public education in order to help solve our, our budget deficit. So how will you not only preserve funds for education, but even potentially increase funding for education, uh, given our current budgetary situation. So those are a couple of the types of questions that could be asked of candidates that would resonate with what matters to likely voters. Well, as someone who crafts questions for surveys and polls, I, I would I would think this would be another way that really extends. I mean, I find it, like, again, I find this incredibly fascinating to actually give some direction to either folks in media or those who are watching, say, here are here are some better ways to ask these questions. Not that the moderators don't ask brilliant questions already. We can all agree on that. But I mean, as far as, <laughs> but, but how much does that help to really advance the conversation? Well, uh, quite a bit. I mean, for the last few years, I, we've often, I'm, and I'm guilty of this, I'll totally admit, encouraging candidates not to participate in debates and forums. Um, we saw this in the gubernatorial race. We've seen this time and time again that the general consensus is that these types of forums and these question answering sessions are not of benefit to the candidates. Part of it is because of the gotcha politics that it's not the, um, it's what you don't say or what you maybe mess up that really ends up being what get, comes out of these forums. You know, you don't, um, you don't really see people answering questions or that audiences care about. And I often have told candidates, hey, don't answer the question that's asked, answer the question that, you know, that makes a point that you want to make. And that's why debates are boring. And that's why people uh, generally have tuned out on some of them. But this gives us the opportunity to appeal to broader audiences. If you're answering these questions, you're going to get more nodding heads in the audience. You're going to get people that are actually, these are the decisions that they want to be made. They're going to walk out of a, a forum saying, oh, they actually talked about the things I care about. And so that's really sort of how this is helpful is uh, really bringing back these forums and these debates to a place where they're valuable uh, to the general public and valuable to voters in general. 
People, I'd love to have you jump on that again, because I think it's just that's one of my favorite points about all of this is it's not just here's some great research and important research, but it's just sort of sitting on a page. We're trying to actually do something with it to help our community. That's absolutely the intention of all of this. You know, as I said, we started as an organization interested because it matters to us as the Center for the Future of Arizona to figure out what Arizonans want. But we realized we were sitting on a gold mine, you know, one, because it's it enables us to counter this narrative of polarization and division. We are so persuaded and bombarded uh, by media messages and candidates who are looking for those wedge issues to feel that we're just so divided. But there's so much that we share. And then how do we how do we um, how can we, um, I don't know, put pressure or or encourage candidates to really be addressing those issues so that voters understand where those candidates stand on those really important issues to voters? Well, and these are not out of the out of the box issues. I, I think if you look at several candidate websites these days, you can find they just sort of they sort of copy and replace chat GPT in the issues that, you know, they feel like their voters care about. These are discussion issues. These are topics that require thought. These are topics that require leadership. And that's one of the big themes that I think we see throughout a lot of this data is that uh, we are in desperate need of leadership as a state and answering these questions requires leadership. And so that's sort of the challenge that I, you know, I know there's candidates tuned in right now looking at this. You can win talking about these topics, but you're not going to win talking about these topics by spending 30 seconds writing up a new bullet point for your website. It's it's thoughtful discussion regarding the topics that will make a big difference. Yeah, and to jump on what Paul just said in terms of the outlook of, of voters, you know, we asked voters if they believe that um, uh, our state is, is prepared for future growth and if leaders are focused on that. And over half of them said they're not confident that we're properly planning uh, for future growth. And we've also asked uh, in previous surveys if we feel we have the leadership that is required. And only if I'm remembering the number correctly, it's only about 28% of Arizonans feel that we have the leadership that we need to take us into the future. So these are, these are you know, voters are looking for leadership and they are not necessarily feeling that we have what we need right now. Well, and it seems like the Arizona voters agenda proves that a great majority of Arizona voters want to have some kind of robust debate about these. Um, Paul, I'll call it bumper sticker. I mean, I think that to some extent we've seen what happens when people running for office just use bumper stickers and don't get into a word that a lot of people in politics don't like nuance. Like there is there there is a lot of there are a lot to discuss here. And of course that's what makes voters' agenda so interesting as well, I think. To really and, break and these things that, down. And on that point about nuance. You know, and this gets threaded throughout all of the issues that we address. You know, two thirds of er likely voters prefer candidates, say they prefer candidates who are willing to negotiate and compromise to find bipartisan solutions. And I dare say that's not what we're necessarily finding going on these days, but that's what likely voters say they want. Well, I will go to our first, uh, first question from the audience on this one. Um, and I'd like to have you both address this one. This attendee would like to hear how the panelists define leadership. Uh, what would Arizona voters want in their leaders? What is missing from the elected official style of leadership now? We can boil that down however specifically the two of you want to get, but, but because leadership can be uh, hard to define, we know vision can be hard to define, but I think when we're talking about leadership, we're talking about people who at least want to, well, want to lead, to be obvious, to actually not just sort of fall in how would the two of you think about leadership and how it's defined in terms of reflecting where the Arizona voters agenda is coming from? Sybil, can I start with you? Sure. I, you know, we're the center for the future of Arizona. So to me, one of the first things about leadership is how do we plan for our future? What are the things that are important to our future? And we certainly, and, and then the second piece of it is listening to what our Arizonans think is important. So Arizonans believe that education is important. They think we need to invest in, in infrastructure. And we'll talk about that in a minute. We've got, um, you know, we have to solve our immigration issues. Leadership is how do you listen to what voters want? How do you actually figure out like how to find those uh, compromise and negotiated bipartisan solutions and advance those as opposed to advancing single-mindedly, you know, an ideological viewpoint? That would be a start. Uh, I mean, number one is having people dictate what they're for, not simply what they are against. Too much of our politics these days are saying, 
don't worry about what I'm for. I just just know that I'm against that. I'm against that person. They're, what they're saying is wrong. I oppose that. Um, and that's a lot what we see these days is it, the affiliation of parties is not necessarily dictated these days by what they are for, but rather what they stand up against. Uh, you know, you see a lot of that negativity, um, you know, dictated by more of a, you know, I'm not Joe Biden or I'm not Donald Trump. And that that's sort of like, oh, if you don't like that person, then you affiliate with the other side. And it creates this adversarial relationship. As Sybil mentioned, 62 percent of our uh, likely voters would want to see um, someone who's willing to cross collaboration across party lines and tackle challenges. Uh, versus somebody who refuses to compromise. Compromise has become a bad word. I mean, negotiations, another big word that we see. We see the budget negotiations happening behind closed doors right now, for example. I mean, these type, when politics worked well, it had negotiation, it had compromise, it had bipartisan support. And we don't see much of that because if you collaborate, you're a traitor. If you do something, uh, you're then you definitely have given up on your side and sort of us or them. So I, the biggest thing for leadership, I'd say, is people who are willing to uh, seek out and give cast what they're for and then trying to find ways to achieve that. Before we move on to one of our more specific issues under state spending, that umbrella, I do want to ask one more question related to that. So because I think uh, I think all of us remember the JFK book, Profiles and Courage. And of course, the late Senator John McCain was someone who was considered to be courageous in that arena as well, because he would actually not just sometimes go against his party, but speak loudly about it. Is the voters' agenda something that could somehow, in in some way, give give courage to some of those elected officials or candidates who would like to speak out more, but are thinking voters don't want that? Well, maybe voters do want that. So maybe maybe we can talk more about these issues and not just sort of side with one side or the other. I that is certainly our intention and our hope, and that's what we work very hard to do, which is to communicate our findings so that. Uh, candidates running for office, candidates already or elected leaders already in office can at least know that this is the foundational um, truth and reality about who we are as Arizonans. Having said that, I do think that you know uh, people running for office, elected leaders are responding to the pressures that they feel, and those pressures may not always be coming from the majority of the people. They may be coming, let's say, in a primary system from from their, their base voters. So you can start seeing that structurally there may be some issues relative to how leaders um, operate because you can't blame them for being elected leaders and responding to where they're feeling those pressures. So I think those two things can be true at once. One is we want elected leaders, those running for office to know this is what the majority of Arizonans uh, want to see happen in, in Arizona. And at the same time, we also understand that those are not necessarily the voices that are going to matter so much to those leaders being elected. Well, as I mentioned, let's move on to the next huge topic, and that is state spending. We we talked a bit about fresh vision, strong leadership, but I want to bring up this number, that the ABA finds 87% total agreement and how it will take higher levels of planning and preparedness to ensure that Arizona has the resources and infrastructure to support growth and maintain our high quality of life. 87% is an incredible number, Paul. And I'm um, when we think about higher levels of planning and preparedness, again, we talked about the leadership, we talked about the vision. What, what does that say to you when 87% of that is this feeling that obviously people come to Arizona for a reason? It's an innovative place. It's a place that is fresh, younger than others. So people want to be able to, to maintain this quality of life. What does that say to you based on this number? Well, I like to often joke that I can't get 87% of the electorate to agree what color the sky is. So to, to see that sort of level of wanting planning and preparedness, people know that we are growing. And um, I often talk to elected officials about, they get very sensitive about growth and get very defensive about it and don't want to address it. Or um, they often get criticized by a vocal minority that whatever they're doing is is begetting negative growth, as it were, like that they, they, they don't want it. But what we really actually see is that the electorate understands that we are a growing state, understand that there needs to be more to uh, keep up with growth, that we don't want to turn into California, that we need additional planning, we need additional transportation investment. Folks moved here for their quality of life. It's generally, people are very happy, especially with local government and their local quality of life in general, um, and they want that to keep up. And so this is a reflection that they understand this and that they want more to be done to make sure that we're prepared 
so that we don't fall behind. Arizona's built a reputation of being a little bit of ahead of the curve on this. I mean, you talk about Prop 300 in 1986, the Prop 400 extension in 2004, Maricopa County in particular, but throughout the state, we've done a really good job of, of planning to keep up with growth and they want to continue that. Yeah, and just to dig in a little bit deeper, you know, what are <clears throat> what are some of the key things that involve growth? Infrastructure is certainly one of those issues um, relative in particular to transportation. We found that 90% of likely voters want to see a robust transportation infrastructure system, including investments in freeway streets and transit in order to move people and goods. So if you're growing, you definitely need to, to be able to get around. And then there's what I would call social infrastructure, which is around childcare assistance. And we've found this consistently through multiple surveys that 77% um, of likely voters feel that Arizona should invest more in childcare assistance for qualifying families. In our previous Gallup survey, we found significant numbers of people who responded that they were not going back to school or back to work because they could not find accessible or affordable childcare. So talk about growth. You need people who are able to get to work, you know, transport themselves to work, and they have to feel peace of mind relative to childcare. And that seems especially timely considering the vote on Prop 479 coming up to extend the transportation sales tax here in Maricopa County, Paul. It seems like that all sort of fits together. Absolutely. I think one of the things that we've seen as a state is a pretty great deal of success in transportation planning. It's I think people understand the connection between the, the planning that we've done and the success we've had as a region and as a state and the strong desire to continue that investment. And so... That's why we see strong support for Prop 479. That's why we see 90% support for a robust transportation system. Um, there's a few things that the Arizona electorates mature on, and one of them is transportation investment. I think they really see the direct connection between in transportation investment and our quality of life. And I will also say, post-COVID in a lot of my regional and local surveys, I've seen a rising concern regarding congestion, particularly in growing areas. Um, I think we all maybe got used to being able to get from one place to another pretty quickly. Um, but as a metropolitan region, we've done a good job addressing congestion. But as we've grown more, as we got, come back from COVID and people are going back to work in other places, there is a rising concern. And so this really speaks to that as a desire among the electorate to continue to make these investments. Paul Sibble, we've got a, got a great response so far from some of our attendees. So let me go to a couple of those questions right now. Um, this is a, a big, interesting question, which I think might give us even more insight into the voters' agenda. This particular attendee says, one of the stumbling blocks seems to be where the money should come from for education spending or to update infrastructure. What does polling say about Arizona's willingness to pay higher income and property taxes? So uh, we did not ask about, uh, well, we've asked multiple questions, I should say, over various surveys. And I can't say that people are begging for taxes to be raised, but at the same time, we had some really interesting findings, particularly in one of our previous surveys, where we said to people, are you willing to pay more in taxes for the things that matter to you? We got 44% flat out said yes, which actually is a pretty interesting number. It's not over the 50%, so we can't say that it made it uh, in terms of the Arizona voters agenda, but but we also had, I think it was 16% who said they didn't know, which is also interesting. And, you know, one could interpret that however one want. But one way I think about it is, well, tell me how you're going to use it or will you use those funds um, properly? So if you had 44% who said yes and 16% who say no, oh, who they don't know, that's 60% that could potentially be there to tap into. Now, of course, um, you know, income taxes are not the only ways to raise revenues. And I think one of the things we're going to be thinking about in our second survey is what is the full panoply of ways that uh, one could raise revenue for the types of things that Arizona voters want to see. So there's more to come on that one. I think the biggest disconnect is we sort of talk about taxes generally or generically. Do you want to raise income taxes? Do you want to raise sales taxes? Do you want to raise... And the general answer among the electorate would be no. There's not a strong desire just to raise taxes. But when you connect them to some of these items that we're talking about, we see time and time again 
that folks are willing, if you set forth what the money is going to be used for, we see it locally when we talk about public safety or street bonds, we see it uh, you know, regionally on transportation plans, we see it uh, throughout the state with, with education funding. When people set forth what the taxation is for and what it will be, how it will be used, we see a desire among the majority of the, of the electorate to make additional investments. And so it is not just that, do you like more taxes? Because if you ask people, would, would you raise taxes? The answer is like, you know, no. But if you want to raise taxes for education, or would you like to spend this kind of spending for this type of investment? We, we see a significantly different number. Yeah. And I think there's really great actual concrete evidence, especially in education. I've lived here 22 years now, and there have been multiple uh, ballot initiatives uh, to increase funding for education. And if I'm not mistaken, I think most of those, except possibly one, all passed. So to me, that's a great validation of our own findings would say that Arizonans want to increase funding for education. And as Paul said, if you show them what you will spend these funds on, and if they're interested, they will vote for it. I want to throw in one more question at this point. This may be difficult to answer, so forgive me in advance, Paul and Sybil. Uh, how do you address the fact that legislators often support education but also want small government by restricting funding while education is one of the largest state budget items? I think that comes back to, Sybil, you like the word gap. Paul used disconnect. Um, I don't want to put either of you in a hole because I think part of the voters' agenda is the idea to, to remind people and let people know what voters really want. But how much does that disconnect make it so... The voters agenda is something that has to be, you have to just keep reminding people of what voters are saying. It can't just be, again, that sort of inactive data on a piece of paper. It's like, no, legislators, when you have this gap or this disconnect with voters, it actually matters because voters may want something different. I love the way Paul says it because you're in such a positive way, which is, you know, look, legislators, this is what Arizonans actually care about and want. And so you can actually succeed by doing this. So that is certainly one one way to look at it. Um, another perhaps less rosy way to look at it is it's not always the case that, and I think I kind of alluded to this previously, it's not always the case that it's these issues that these leaders are elected on. Maybe it's on those uh, wedge issues or those hot button issues in the primary system that we have set up. So there's, you know, you can start getting disconnects there. So it's 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 kind of a mixed bag in that sense in terms of of the impact of what voters want on elected leaders. But Paul, you you say this so well too. Well, I think the is, I know is specifically about education. Bear in mind, among the likely voters here, only about twenty six percent had kids under the age of eighteen at home, which means. More than 70% of likely voters who are making decisions regarding education don't currently have kids within our school system. Add to that that education is experiential. Everybody walked uphill in the snow both ways to school uh, for years and years in a one, one room classroom where they taught reading, writing, and arithmetic, and that was it. You know, I, I think everybody has, sort of has this defined view of education, and then they also don't have kids in the classroom anymore. So they're not necessarily well versed in what's going on in the current school. So that means that external views, that 85% that think the media is creating division, this is one of the areas where it is in fact true. We see media reporting about education impacting people's perceptions of our schools and the education system. And so um, it perpetuates this notion that if you know schools had plenty of money, if they just tighten their belt and cut administration, simply not true, but to dissuade people of and disaffect folks of that takes a lot of work. But we also know at the same time, most folks think that schools are underpaid or underfunded and teachers are underpaid. And so what that leads to is that the easy, the path of least resistance to say, let's increase teacher pay. But I know school administrators are like, well, you know, we have other needs as well. And, and so we, it's finding sort of that balance there because sort of the path of least resistance is often like, let's just increase teacher pay. And then that would help sort of the overall problem. We have a couple more questions we will definitely get to before the webinar is over. We have a little more than 15 minutes left. One of the major topics also covered in the Arizona Voters Agenda is immigration. Well, let's begin with the numbers on enacting comprehensive immigration reform that includes a pathway to citizenship. People might be surprised at what those numbers show. 
Yes, yeah, 77% of the electorate would support uh, comprehensive immigration reform that includes a pathway to citizenship. And that's how we defined it. We didn't go too deep into that. It includes 61% of Republicans, 92% of Democrats, and then more than 80% of independent and unaffiliated voters. It's a big, it's a big number. And I think, you know, going back to even the gang of eight and some of this discussion, I think this is one of the big areas where you use that phrase disconnect, Steve. And I think it's true where it is such a hot button topic. 70% of Republicans, it's their number one issue, immigration, where we see that the, the debate and rhetoric and the cowboy hats and boots going down to the border and touring the border don't reflect what the overall electorate wants. The overall electorate would like uh, some sort of immigration reform that helps with commerce and uh, ensuring that a functioning board for commerce and immigration. And that's what we like, what the electorate like to see, but it doesn't necessarily translate because these folks, as Sybil mentioned, who get elected in the primary, um, they have a slightly different approach of what they care about compared to what the overall electorate cares about. Sybil, that question about the Paul just alluded to about uh, the creation of a functioning border for commerce and immigration, I have to admit I've stolen that one for a couple of debate questions we've had because I, I it, it encompasses it so well in terms of a even a more practical sense. So it's not just about the visuals people may see uh, in media, it's actually something that shows, okay, this is, we're trying to cover this entire swath of this very complicated issue. What did some of the results of this say to you? And and, and frankly, if you wouldn't mind, there's another question or two related to immigration that came out of the voters agenda specifically on immigration or border security. Well, this is another great example of a question that we've asked multiple times, and we always have very high levels of response on uh, likely voters and Arizonans wanting um, to see comprehensive immigration reform with a pathway to citizenship, and we ask it exactly that way. Now, there are other issues that um, you know did not make the agenda, um, largely because there are differences between Democrats and Republicans on certain issues. So we do want to acknowledge that. So, for example, completing the wall, we did not get that magic 50% or above across the board support for that, but again, acknowledging that Republicans overall tend to be more supportive of that particular um, outcome. Uh, restricting, um, you know, uh, asylum um, uh, require requirements for, you know, claiming asylum, that didn't make it on the agenda um, either. But again, acknowledging that there are differences. But there are some very powerful areas of agreement. And so certainly the comprehensive immigration reform with pathway to citizenship, uh, functioning border for commerce and immigration, and also 82% um, of likely voters want leaders to work together to find bipartisan solutions to humanitarian and refugee crisis at the southern border. So huge agreement on the, the fact that there is it is considered a humanitarian crisis and that we need to be addressing that. So yes, it's a compl complex issue, immigration, but we hear over and over and over that voters want to see comprehensive approach and a bipartisan approach to this issue. And I saw in the chat, someone said, well, what does a functioning border mean? That's the question. That's what we should be asking candidates is define that functioning border. What does that mean to you? Um, this is back to Steve's point about bumper sticker politics. I think immigration is probably the finest example of the bumper sticker politics where you have somebody, um, you know, say, build the wall or open borders. You know, I mean, it's it's sort of boiled down to the point where it's it's almost difficult to actually see what people are for. And so um, it's definitely, that's what we're saying is that's a big question that you should be asking candidates. You should be asking our politicians, our elected officials, what does a functioning border mean to you? And I should just emphasize that we're very much focused on what are the outcomes that Arizonans want and leadership is about figuring out how you work with your colleagues of different political stripes to reach that outcome. And, and I don't want to take us too far off track, but I'm, as you can tell, I'm kind of excited about the Arizona Voters Agenda and what it says. And I want to go back to Paul briefly, what you said about the Gang of Eight. When we fold leadership into that, uh, you know, that, that was a while ago. And I think George W. Bush was president, so it's been a number of years. And then Arizona senators were heavily involved, whether it was McCain and Kyle or Jeff Flake later. These are people who are who are very powerful, and there was a bipartisan support. So, in essence, I wonder: can voters take heart in the numbers they see in the voters' agenda from the standpoint that even powerful senators were sort of turned back by by something going on in the atmosphere? These are not people who were just collecting signatures on a corner. These were powerful people. So, can the voters' agenda 
frankly, maybe get more powerful people to want to be involved. And it's not just a gang of eight, maybe a gang of 20, for example, or something like that. Well, I mean, first of all, it demonstrated they were on the right track. I mean, so often we we hear about these policy issues that are narrowly defined and, you know, only a handful of folks care about them. And we ask all the time, why are we debating this? Why are we caring about this issue or that issue? Because somebody vocally taken care of it. The Gang of Eight proposal, immigration reform, that's something that big portions of the electorate want and care about. And it's one of the things that I do think when we go back to that question of that 60% plus don't think that we're focused on the issues that matter most. This is one of them. This is a place where we know they're on the right track. And this is an encouragement to our leaders to be a gang of 20 or be a gang of 31, um, you know, that solves these problems because they're on the right side of this. As I've said a couple of times now, you can win talking about immigration reform. You can win by bringing people together to solve these problems. You don't have to create and just continue to perpetuate the specter of something like immigration to be successful, uh, you can win on these topics. I think that's one of the really interesting things about our findings, which is there are issues out there being hotly debated, hot button issues. And what we're able to do also through the voters agenda is see what are the ones that really matter to Arizona's likely voters and what are the ones that are the loud voices that are in the minority. And I think we're sort of able to kind of chart our way through uh, sorting those out. And as Paul said, then candidates running for office can really understand which are the issues that really matter to Arizonans versus the ones that are 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 more of those wedge issues and minority voices. One more attendee question for the two of you. This may be unanswerable, but how can we, the royal we, I suppose, get the state legislature to listen and act on what the citizens of Arizona want? Well, you know, our mission certainly at Center for the Future of Arizona is to try to get the word out about these findings. We are doing the morning scoop. We're meeting with legislators. We're meeting with legislative staff. We're meeting with the media. Uh, We just did a big tour of the media around the state to try to understanding that they really help set the tone and the topics for conversation. So we're doing everything that we can to get the word out because I think it is knowledge is power. And as Paul said, if if, um, candidates and elected leaders understand that these are fundamentally important issues to voters or which ones are not so much, that that can be power for them in terms of taking the right kind of action. I think the biggest challenge we're up against is this built up callous of pessimism, that there's so much pessimism. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've presented this data and folks say, oh, that's all fine and good, but you know, that's not how it really works. So the issue is, no, this is how it works. This is what, you know, voters choose based on what's presented to them. And so the, I get asked a lot, well, why do they keep electing the same people if this is what they really want? Well, it's the options that they're given, right? This is what's presented to them. And so they they have to choose something off the menu. Um, they're not going to just not eat. Everybody, you know, we need leadership and we need uh, elected officials. But it's, it's sort of breaking through that uh, overall sort of patina here and recognizing and demonstrating that there is a better way. And that with leadership and with people, looking at these topics and talking about them. Um, You know, this, we, as I keep saying, you can win talking about these topics. And once somebody does it and demonstrates it, I think it becomes easier. But until that point, we see so many folks just take that alternative road, which is the divide and conquer, negativity, attack ads, you know, uh, that sort of uh, items here. It it will take someone demonstrating, and we've seen some elected officials do some of this, right? Build more consensus, appeal to the broader electorate. But until more and more folks do that, we're sort of stuck in this holding pattern for now. Well, and Sybil, I'd love to follow up quickly on Paul's point on that, because um, to pull back the curtain briefly, one of the things that in our sort of pre-webinar meeting that you mentioned, which I find fascinating, is you'll find people who are more involved more knowledgeable, let's say, on a daily basis of electoral politics and whatever, and they're the ones who are more cynical than those who may just be saying, oh, this this sounds great, saying, no, 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 no. It's kind of what Paul said, right? It's true. I won't name any names, but I was recently in front of a chamber group, a public policy, public affairs group that had a lot of lobbyists. And I, I always kind of brace myself because they tend to be the most cynical because they are often, you know, in the thick of it and don't, and sort of see the way things work, but don't necessarily believe or imagine that it could be different. And so what's interesting to me is when I'm out and about more in a broad community, people get very emotional 
and um, and grateful to know that we really do have much more in common and share much more agreement than disagreement on these really important issues to Arizonans. And so how do we close that gap? How do we figure out how to persuade leaders that the majority, what the majority wants really is important. We are a representative democracy. How do we perfect that and make sure that we can move forward? I find it somewhat interesting too that at this point, of course, that when we think about solutions and some of the phrasing even in the voters' agenda says bipartisan solutions, because that's the system we have now. But there, are, as you, as Paul, you mentioned with the way the polling is done, almost a third of the folks spoken to were unaffiliated voters. Right. Unaffiliated voters choose that these days. This is not they they want to not be of a party. They don't want to be forced to pick. I, I get to ask the question a lot. Why don't independents just form a party? Well, that's exactly what they don't want to do. They want to. And they the other thing is that it's not just necessarily that they think one party's they hate both parties. In fact, they a lot of independents think both parties have good ideas and want to be able to pick and choose. And so what we're talking about is you know, there's a reason local government is popular. Local government is nonpartisan. Everybody competes on the same ballot. They all, um, you know, it's a marketplace of ideas. Um, the approval ratings are much higher and the people thinking that the cities are headed in the right direction um, is much, much higher than we see in the state. And that's one of the challenges we have here in this partisan primary system where almost 80% of our elected officials are picked in the primary. Um, the result is they don't focus on these issues that we care most about. In fact, I was talking to an elected official once and I was demonstrating some of this data and they said, yeah, but my people don't care about that. And I said, no, 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 this issue passed overwhelmingly in your legislative district. And they said, well, I don't get, I don't get elected in the general, I get elected in the primary and my primary people don't care about that. And so until we change people's mind about that, which is probably an electoral reform to do that, um, until we change people's mind about that, we won't get to this solution because they're just they're so narrowly focused on such a small segment of the electorate. They don't pay attention to what the broader audience actually cares about. And so before I ask you to wrap us up, I did have a couple of questions from a couple of our attendees to ask about some topics that may or may not have been covered. And maybe they're coming in the next agenda. Um, one of the attendees asked whether there was any consensus on health care policy issues or is that something that might come in the next survey? So we've asked about healthcare in our Gallup surveys, but um, in this particular survey, we have not asked about that. Uh, for the, our post primary, we know that we're going to be asking about elections. So in our last survey in 22, we asked Arizona and likely voters if they felt our elections were safe, secure, and accurate. And we got 75% who said, yes, we'd like to know how they're feeling now. Um, we will ask more about education, some on the economy, and we're also trying to figure out what else might be topical. So if there's areas of interest, please put them in the chat. We will track that or questions that you think might be important. So we're still developing the questions for our second survey. So we'd love to know, know more about that. Oh, yes, water. And we're asking about water issues. <laughs> Yes. Water is a big one. We will be. Yeah, sorry, I knew there was one I was I had was just blanking on there momentarily. Yes, and I, and I didn't ask about environment, but obviously that's a big part of the Arizona we want. Sybil, another part of Center for the Future of Arizona. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, so, Sybil, before I ask you to wrap us up, Paul, any any final thoughts? I mean, you said some amazing things today, but uh, the thirty to sixty second window. Just thank you for tuning in, everyone, and thank you to Sybil and the whole team at CFA for allowing me to be a part of this. This is one of my highlights just to really be able to look into these items and really sort of center the opinion because after years and decades of kind of working in politics you know when i first started i really liked knowing the secret who voted and why they voted but over the last few years it's become more of a curse than a secret and just this is the type of opportunity that really gives me the chance to uh, you know, be more aspirational, share people where we find agreement. And I just really appreciate it. And I appreciate everyone taking the time to tune in. We didn't do the PowerPoint show today with a lot of slides and reading people data. So, but there's links in the chat, take the time to look through the links themselves and read it for yourself. And if you have questions, let us know. But I, there's a lot of exciting data in there. And I encourage you to take a look. And Paul, do you know that data at uh, that presentation at weddings and bar mitzvahs or no? <laughs> if necessary. <laughs> <laughs> well, Sybil, wrap us up with just reminding people what CFA does and how important the Arizona Voters Agenda fits into what the mission of the organization is. Yeah, so as I said, we, from, the, from early on, we realized that 
as smart as we were, we it wasn't up to us to decide what was important for the future of Arizona. And that's really where this idea of doing these really in-depth, regular public opinion survey came in. And we were probably as surprised as anyone that about the levels of agreement we found on really important issues, because just like many of you, we get bombarded with these negative messages about partisanship and division. And so, you know, I, I kind of see ourselves in the business of hope, you know, sharing um, what we have in common and hoping that people will run with that and be inspired by it and take action so that we can actually create a positive agenda and a positive um, momentum going forward. So, you know, I sometimes say there's always cynics in the audience. Please don't be cynical. This is actually real. We really do agree on much more than we disagree. And that matters. And it matters to our future. And it matters to 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 take that to heart and to do something with it. So thank you all. Thank you, Steve. Great conversation. And Paul, we love working with you. And thanks to all of you for joining us this morning. And that concludes this Arizona Capital Times Morning Scoop, What Do Arizona Voters Want? Sponsored by Center for the Future of Arizona. Thank you to Sybil Francis, Chair, President, and CEO of Center for the Future of Arizona, and Paul Bentz, Senior Vice President, of Research and Strategy at High Ground. And thank all of you for taking your time this morning. I'm Steve Goldstein. Thanks, everyone.